Thanks for the introduction. Uh, should I keep that one on or just the one I'm wearing is enough? I, I, cl I, sh I close it. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. All right. So yeah, thanks for the introduction. I also always try to hide the fact that I did my bachelor in physics because then, you know, people will expect that I'll, I'll know something about physics now. <laughs> so, but now you outed me. So yeah, feel free to ask questions about that. Um, so there's been uh, some abuse of notation about what geometric deep learning is. And it's actually, it's fun to work, to be in that field because then, you know, we can just kind of collect all those things that fall from the other traditional deep learning, right? So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I like to say, to think about that, that anything that doesn't fit in a regular grid, we'd like to call geometric deep learning. And then that's general enough, but specific enough at the same time so you can write grants and get money to do the research on these things, right? Um, so I'm currently a postdoc at uh, Facebook AI and uh, moving to Stanford uh, in September for a second year of a, of a postdoc. And um, yeah, let's uh, dive in. I like this to be open for discussions because I have like many slides and if I'll just go through all of them, uh, I mean, it might interest you for a couple of slides. But some, some slides, I, I, you know, if they interest you, then I don't have enough of, and then we can just open this for discussion. So just feel free to interrupt me with questions, and it's okay if you don't finish them because they're online. So starting with 3D, I mean, I always like to go back to this to this uh, paper that kind of, you know, we took, a, not, not we, I'm not part of this paper, but uh, the authors on this paper took a bunch of images and then kind of rebuild a 3D model. I always like to look at this as an example to how we keep representations in an efficient way, right? So there's something a little bit unsatisfying about just keeping all those images because in the end, they're just there as some projection of what's there in 3D. So I always like to start with saying that, you know, 3D is just a better representation uh, of the world. It's also important to, to understand where we come from when we say 3D because many times when researchers have talked about 3D, we thought of you know a handful of clean meshes and and synthetic objects that artists created for us to work on, not for us actually for themselves, but then we took those, but only a few right so like no massive massive data collections to actually uh, work on but nowadays, I mean similar to kind of like the transition that images have seen, you know when I guess in the old days people have tried to create models of images by using springs and masses and, and stuff like that. But then, you know, everyone has a camera in their pocket, so let's use that. I think this is something that we see in 3D starting to happen. So this is the right time to kind of prepare for the revolution of, of 3D. So this new iPhone already has a scanner in the front camera that produces pretty dense point cloud. Uh, if you want to use, if there are apps out there that can only give you that, uh, that can already give you that in, uh, data. So we're almost ready, right? And it's not just the, this camera. So we have a bunch of sensors and now they're smaller and cheaper. And it's not only about acquiring the data because we also need to ask, okay, so we have acquired data, what can we do with it? So now we can have, uh, we have ton, like VR and AR devices so we can enjoy that data. We, can, um, we need to process it in different ways. We can print it. Um, and some companies try to drive with it as well, right? So that's also important. So what's our job? I'd like to think of our job as, you know, being there to collect good data sources and then at the same time develop the tools that will allow us to work on this on these type of data. Um, yeah, and that's the, to me, that's the fun part. And I'll start with maybe addressing one key property of 3D that's different than 2D, because I think you know, in 2D, you probably heard a lot this week about different ways to process the data, but somehow everything starts with a continent. And one reason that that's possible is the fact that images are represented on a regular grid, and that's kind of like agreed by everyone. So we know that the camera manufacturers, they're not gonna do anything radical for the next, you know, the next version of the iPhone will still have an array. And that means that we can keep our algorithms still working on arrays, that's fine. They're gonna be 2D, they're not gonna invent any, you know, some, uh, some sort of a weird thing because that will influence an entire complex pipeline. In 3D, we don't have that agreement, right? So 
because it's kind of maybe early stage and also not because it's early stage, also because it's not always appropriate to use the same representation because you have different needs in the end. So uh, without this agreement, we're left with a bunch uh, of representations. These are uh, the ones that, are, that I'm showing here are probably the most common ones. So, um, right, so I'll talk about, um, so one of them is still images, right? Like the first slide I showed, it's just a bunch of images that represent some underlying 3D object that's still valid, so we can still use that. Um, if not, then we have point clouds, and I'll talk about each of them, right? Uh, meshes, voxels, and I'll briefly mention also level sets, maybe not so briefly, depending on your questions. Um, all right, so let's maybe take an extra minute to maybe go through a bunch of things. So it was important to me when preparing the slides to kind of push the message that 3D is not just these guys. It's not always the case where you get a 3D or you're trying to output something in 3D is when you need 3D, okay? And what do I mean by that? So let's take this example, you know, you have an image and let's say you wanna do some kind of enhancement, denoising, depth of field, whatever. And we can think even with, you know, even if your model if, assuming you're, you're, doing, you're solving that problem with, with a neural network, even if the model runs in 2D on a 2D input and outputs a 2D, it has to understand something about the 3D or the depth of this scene, right? For example, if you, wanna, if you wanna put one object in focus but not the others, then you need to understand what's the difference between a boundary between object, objects and a boundary within an object, right? If, if the stripes of the zebra are boundaries within the object, you still want them in the same focus. But if the boundary is between two zebras and they're not standing at the same distance, then you want to understand that. And distance is already not, is no longer 2D, right? So, and, and the axis I, point, uh, I put here is going from implicit to, to explicit. And I, th and I think if you read recent literature, not all papers mention this, but you can find some part of the network that you, you can think of as like, you know, somewhere in between, on that spectrum, between very implicit and very explicit. And that's, that's a game I like to play when I read those papers. So this is actually from, from a work we recently submitted. And in here, we had like the same, the same thing. So imagine you have like two images and you wanna say, are they the same? And again, like 2D methods working on images, doing metric learning, perform very well using features like color. Uh, but once you change the, the view angle significantly, then maybe you can benefit from seeing many other 3D models of cars, right? So you, you can imagine some underlying 3D model of a car is placed somewhere in, in the memory of the networks that you, so that you can uh, utilize it. Um, a little more towards the explicit side is, is the multi-view representation. I'll talk about that, that later, but we can all understand that if, if it's a bunch of images and they're there to represent a 3D model, then there's already, you know, importance in talking about 3D. Yes, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so essentially the purpose is just to say that 3D exists even if the input and the output are not 3D, right? So the 3D is useful even, even if the input in this case is 2D and say the output, for example, is a 1D, like a decision whether it's same car or not the same car. Yeah. So obviously if I told you that the output I'm expecting here is a 3D reconstructed model of the car, you'd be immediately convinced that 3D is necessary, right? But I'm just saying that even if the output is not 3D, still maybe 3D is, is useful somewhere implicitly inside the model. That's, uh, that's the key message. Um, right, and this is a, a, very, a very cool work from, uh, from, from DeepMind from I guess like two years ago, where uh, again, at no point in the system, so what's happening here is that they try to teach the network about the existence of this scene. But the way they do it is by only showing it images from different viewpoints, and then they want the network to be able to generate a new image. So again, the input is 2D, and the output is also 2D, but with a camera direction. So it means that somewhere inside, the model needs to build a 3D understanding of the scene, otherwise how could it you know, generate it? But what type of a 3D model? It's definitely not one of those four or five that I showed in the first slide, right? We don't know, right? We don't know. 
So that's um, right. Now, oops, that, that should have been 3D. So of course, when we go towards more explicit 3D, that's, that's clear, right? So here the input is 2D, but the output you're interested in is, is a 3D point cloud. So definitely 3D is important here as a, as a representation. Surely all those applications that start with 3D and try to do something like segmentation, you know, correspondences, object detection, that's like what you immediately think of when you, when you say 3D. And, and to some extent, maybe like, it's not fair to call this slide 3D and then say that's beyond 3D, but I'm going outside the spectrum and we care about other things that are like, especially graphs. Uh, that could be used to represent 3D, but are more general. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so maybe let's briefly discuss uh, the two first representations. So the first one is the multi-view. And the reason I don't want to touch too much upon that is because you've heard the entire week about 2D uh, neural networks. So you kind of already know how to solve this, this thing. And the other one uh, uh, is voxel groups. So let's talk about the two. Um, so here, let's say that the problem is you take a bunch of images and you want to classify this thing, for example. So you basically process each image independently using your, your CNN, and then essentially you don't care about the fact that he was, he was a 3D. So the first works that have done this type of things, they just said, okay, let's take the collection of images, and the only thing we need to care about is how to pull them uh, together. But once I pull them together, I have one feature vector and I can process that and try to classify or something. Right? So, um, Right, this is another, another example. In, in this example, we actually, so here is again one of those examples where we're somewhere in between the implicit and explicit where each image is being processed individually, but the way they're aggregated, and, and this is something that I kind of want to put out there as maybe a general message that doesn't necessarily have to do with this talk, that if you're no longer, you know, if you don't know what happens in the network at all, but you only care about one output that's like a classification, then fine. I mean, that, that representation can lie anywhere. It could be the, you know, the layer before the feature or the uh, logits or, or whatever you want. But if you want to do aggregation, then it may be a smart idea to ask the network to give you to do processing such that the operation you want to do is easy. And what do I mean by that? So for example, here, we took a bunch of images and we represented them each in a 3D frame. And what the, the reason we did that is because we wanted some kind of a, of a 3D reconstruction. And what we know to do, right, what's difficult to do is to merge two images because how do you do that? But if those are already 3D models, then it's just a union operator, right? So the, the thing I need to ask my network, just give me something, give me a representation where it's easy to unify things, right? So this just is a general message, but that's again like an example of, of usage of, of 2D images to represent an underlying uh, 3D model. So here it's a classification, and here is a 3D reconstruction, and also that representation can give you a novel view render. Voxel grids were probably the first, you know, the most naive um, generalization from 2D to 3D, right? So you move from pixels to voxels, just add another dimension. It's also easy in terms of the, um, uh, the machinery you have. You don't have to introduce, except for memory, which we'll discuss, you don't have to invent anything new, right? You just add one more dimension. What's one more dimension if you already work with a very deep, um, you know, uh, per pixel representation? So each, each pixel is no longer RGB, right? But we have like hundreds and hundreds of, of features. So you just add one more dimension and then you put the feature. So everything stays kind of, kind of the same. And, and it works to some extent. The main issue with this thing, and the reason it doesn't, uh, like we're trying to find other solutions, is, is mainly resolution, right? So here's this one example. There are many, many such uh, you can find online that basically say that if this is the thing you wanna, uh, you wanna represent, then um, if you run a really good representation that keeps all the details, then you're starting to find, you're starting to have, sorry, a memory issue, right? Because you need to now keep huge uh, arrays in your memory. So you can no longer process many batches together, like all, the, all those nice, nice things that you like to do. Right. Sorry? 
right? So you can imagine that you have this VD model, right? And you place, um, you just place a, a like, a, sorry, Lego. Yeah, it ends up looking like a Lego, but essentially because you take just a 3D grid, right? And say it's a 32 by 32 by 32 voxel grid, and then you can have a, like a decision if if that voxel is is completely free of of let's say existing points, then it's just not not occupied, and if number of points in that voxel exceeds a certain threshold, then maybe it is occupied. So you can have many, many ways to decide whether you, it's occup uh, occupied or not, just according to the threshold. Oh, 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 sorry, so it's the percentage of the, of the occupied voxels, right? So this one says that if you use a 32 by 32 by 32, then you'll see that like at least more or less 10% have been used, but the rest are zeros, or just free space, right? The issue is that, um, you need to process this free space unless otherwise treated. You don't, you don't, like, your network doesn't know what's a zero and what's not a zero in terms of, of computation. You're gonna input that huge thing. 10% of this is, is, is actually has like meaning, meaningful values. The other are zeros, but you're gonna process everything, so you need to keep everything in memory. And as you want more resolution, then less and less usage is, is, being, uh, is being actually used. So you're mainly processing zeros right, just to win more, more resolution, right, so that surely not is the optimal way. Right, right, so, so few techniques that try to uh, mitigate this is, the first is um, still in, in voxel world, right, it's uh, octrees, so that follows kind of like a hierarchical split of the, of the space, so whatever, if you have, you start with large voxels and they're completely empty, then you can imagine that there's no reason to split them, to break them apart to smaller voxels. Um, and then you can do this iterative process. And this one is, is going <laughs> one, one extra step further and, and kind of computes objects in a hierarchical way again, but in a kind of like an onion layers. Um, I mean, the techniques are interesting. In my mind, whatever is not simple enough is just not, not gonna not gonna stay, you know, this community likes simple things, like the computers want to do simple operations because they can scale up very quickly. These things are very interesting ideas, but I don't see a lot of adoption in the community to those techniques. Um, right, so that's, that's, a, that's for, for voxels. Anyone has questions on the two multi-view or voxels? All right, let's go into the more interesting stuff. So I think, so hopefully it's convincing that voxel is not the, the best way to go. And especially if you want like a good representation of an object. So meshes, you know, graphic people, graphics people have already used meshes for, you know, for so long because of exa exactly this, this reason, why right? you, you just, you know, have an efficient way to represent a smooth surface. Um, right, and point clouds, yeah, I'll talk about point clouds. Uh, maybe I'm talking about that first, right? So for point clouds, um, it's, so actually I'd argue that the reason we, we want point clouds is not for representation. Because if you think about it, whenever people, re, whenever you, you want, so you can't draw a point cloud, right? Because a point doesn't have any, you know, it doesn't occupy space, right? So it's not a representation issue as much as it is um, a, a sensor issue, right? Now that we have LIDARs sensing, you know, uh, situated on top of cars, so we just get this data in such a structure that we need to know how to process. No, no, so it's not, okay, so that's a very good question. Um, so maybe I'll start with describing a point cloud because that's very intuitive and then when I get to the talk about meshes, I'll tell you exactly the difference, right? But, but what you should keep in mind for now is that the main difference is that in point clouds, it's just a bunch of points and the mesh also tells you how the points are connected, okay? Just a simple example, if you, you, know, you sampled my fingers, right? And the point here and the point here are as close as the point here and the point here. The difference is that you don't want to connect these two, but you do want to connect these two. These two are situated on the same surface and these are not, right? So you, in order to understand that that's, right, okay. Mm. Right, so in terms of the representation, yes. Um, whether you can or cannot fold or unfold, you know, a, a, a 2D, um, a 2D plane to the entire 3D surface now has to do with the topology of the 3D uh, shape you're trying to represent. Um, but, but yes, locally at least you can be, build those atlases and, and do that. Right, so let's start with, with point clouds. I think this is like something that the community cares about a lot in recent years and, and I, 
I'd argue that mainly it's the driving force of the, yeah, no pun intended, but the driving force of the auto-driving auto community, right? And I think, like, so what are the challenges when we want to work with, with uh, when we want to work with, with uh, point clouds that's different from, uh, say, image pixels, right? So, A, we don't want to first process it. So one, one thing that we could do is we can convert this to a voxel grid, right? You just place your grid around the object, and then you're back at the voxel grid, so we have a solution for that, great. But you want to go raw, because you don't want to invent data, you don't want to lose resolution, you want to be efficient, and you don't want to process zeros. That's, that's one thing. Uh, another thing that, um, so that's the unstructured part, right? Another thing that point sets are sets, right? So they don't have uh, a defined order. So that's also something we need to address, right? If there's no, if I put a grid, I essentially hint that there's uh, an up direction and there's an order in which I can process those points. Um, if I want to push them to a recurrent neural network and treat them like, I don't know, like text inputs or audio input, it has order. Uh, this is just a set, right? Whether I permute it or not shouldn't matter to the algorithm. So, right. So how do we how do we treat how do we handle this this thing? So, a few years back there was this pointnet paper that came out. That I think was the kind of the original paper that started the, the whole rush for for point cloud networks. And it started with this like very very um, very simple observation: is that if you want to be invariant to the order of the points, then essentially you need to only work with symmetric functions, right? And a symmetric function is essentially what I just said, right? A function that doesn't care about the, the order of, uh, of the input. It produces the same, the same output. And some easy examples of such functions would be, for example, if I give you a set of values and I just ask you what is the maximal value out of all those values, then you don't care about the order in which I gave you those values, right? Uh, another thing you can do is just, you know, just combine them together, add them together. And there are many of those. So that's exactly what uh, uh, Pointed is proposing is proposing to do. So you start with your n by three uh, representation of a point cloud. You have on n points in 3D, so n by three, right? And the first thing that the network does, I don't know if you can see. Hmm. I don't have a pointer, but the first thing that the network does is it processes each point independently, right? That's the other. That's the other thing that you can do that keeps you um, equivariant to the order, right? So, so one option is to you know, make an operation like adding all the points together and then you're invariant because you don't care uh, about the permutation. But another thing you can do is, is be equivariant. So you do the operation point-wise, right? And if you permute, then it changes, but it changes in the same way. So if you first do the operator and then permute, or if you first permute and then do the operation, you get the same result. And um, so that's another, kind of a legal operator that you can do. So you can take the endpoints and process each of them individually, say, by passing them through a multi-layer construct on uh, uh, each of them separately, right? But now you can introduce one of those symmetric functions, say the, the max pair channel max, right? So now you, 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 let's say you went from n by three, and I'm skipping some part here, to n by 1024, you can, in a channel-wise fashion, take the maximal value of those points and just global pool, and you're now agnostic to the order in which you saw the, the data. Is this clear? Right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Oh, it's, it's just the number of channels at each layer of the MLP, right? So you start with three, and then you have like essentially a matrix multiplying you from three to 16 or whatever. So this will be like, take your 64 to 124 to 1028. Yeah, it's just a design choice. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and there's some some interesting um, um, observation in, in the paper about um, so the property of this thing essentially says that you don't lose a lot, right? Or you can be as close as possible to the, to the function you actually want to represent while still being uh, order invariant. And maybe you know a little intuition about that because when I first read the paper, it was kind of puzzling to me for you know why. Is it even useful to process each point individually, right? So what's a point it's really gonna tell you? It's just a point, right? So if it doesn't communicate with the, any of the other points, what kind of information can it, can it you know, hold? Even if you 
take the three dimensions and represent it in a 1024, right? So one interesting intuition behind that part is, let's take this simple example. Let's imagine that the network, so one option, right? So it's just choosing another parametric way to represent the point cloud. Right? Here's the simplest example. Say that what the network is actually doing, it takes, a, it places effectively a grid around the point cloud, right? And how can it do that? So if each point is a point in space, then the network can simply say, okay, let's say that I have 1024 values to represent that point. So I can think of, of, like, uh, of like a 3D grid with indicator functions representing like one and zero elsewhere. And if the point XYZ is situated inside one of those voxels, I'm gonna, in the 1024 dimensions, I'm gonna place one and zero elsewhere, right? So I'm not saying that that's what the network is doing. I'm saying that that's one trivial way for a representation to take a three uh, coordinates and just represent them differently in a thousand dimensions, but that now has a meaningful representation of the shape because if we have that, then just doing a max pool will exactly give you the voxelized shape back. Right, does that make sense? So that's one way that, that at least I could get my head around like why it should even be useful. Now allowing the network to train and do something more fancy, then you can think of things like, hey, maybe, you know, similar to what people have done in dictionary learning and then techniques like that, maybe there are more re um, recurring structures in 3D, right? So for example, if I see a bunch of points, it's wasteful to represent each of them in its own voxels, but I can have, I can think of them as like having multiple evidences for the existence of a plane, right? So now I'm not gonna waste whatever, 15 dimensions out of my one, uh, 1024 to represent that plane, but I'm gonna just have one indicator function for a plane at a certain degree at a certain location. I hope this wasn't confusing. I'm just trying to say like there are many, many ways to parameters this space, and the fact that the network is, is, is working, is doing these operations uh, point-wise shouldn't hint that it's not, meaning, uh, not useful, right? Okay, just to give you like, you know, you know, plus placing some, some additional bells and whistles on top of that, that thing. So for example, one thing that you can do is, is if you wanna be somewhat invariant to transformations in, uh, in, the, global, uh, in the global shape, then you can, you can place some kind of a transformer network. So a first network that sees the point cloud and decides, okay, I'm gonna rotate it in a certain degree. And then they added one both to handle the input and, both to, and, and also to handle the features later on. So the first one is, is kind of like very intuitive. The other one is less so, but still seems to help. And another question that you can ask is, okay, that global feature can allow me to do, to answer global questions, like what is that shape, right? I can do that, I can do classification. But what if I care about going back to the original resolution and say something about each point, maybe what part of the shape that point, that point belongs to? So in order to do that, they just do a simple trick. They take the global feature and they concatenate it to each of the individual points, right? So they go back to the original endpoints or from some intermediate uh, stage of where there were like 64 dimensions and they just concatenate the same feature over and over again. So this is a duplicate of the same, of the same vector. But you can think of each row here as now having some information about each individual point and all others. So that's already, uh, allowing communication between each point and it's the rest of the shape, if, uh, if you will. And that, if you keep that resolution, then you can keep processing each point individually, but now it's, it's aware of the existence of all the other points, so you can get back results that are, um, uh, that are meaningful. For example, you can do part segmentation. Uh, so first, any questions about those additions? No. So um, yeah, so for the task of object classification, uh, that, that has already kind of shown, um, you know, as, as the first work that's not doing uh, voxel grids or not image-based, uh, it was already impressive in terms of the result that it, that, that it got. You know, that's like one, one thing you, uh, you learn the hard way is when, whenever you want to reinvent, or sorry, to invent something new, and you have to fight with things that are so well engineered, it's very hard to push an idea to be state of the art. So you, you either find a reviewer that's willing to accept the fact that you know, novelty can come at the expense of maybe sometimes being the best, uh, or you just have to sit on that for like a year before you can you know, push that. Um, so I think, yeah. 
sorry for using the stage for self uh, frustration. <laughs> and then, um, and then, as I said, so this this shows classification. So essentially, the things that you can do once you have a global representation, and this shows what you can do once you did once you added this global representation and kept processing each point individually. So now you can do things like uh, do part segmentation, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was gonna do this. Yes. And then I'll go back to that slide. So here, here, for example, the task was was part segmentation, right? So now you can paint uh, different parts as belonging to different. Uh, you, you can have supervision for that. You can train for that as a pair point uh, task. Right. Um, this is also a cool experiment that they show in the paper that gives some some very nice intuition on what the network is learning, and that has to do with the specific type of global operator that they chose, namely the the max operator. So if you remember the max operator, the symmetric function it, at the global pooling stage that they chose to use is a pair, is a pair feature uh, max operator, right? So let's say point number one screams the loudest at feature number 15, then that feature is going to hold for the global pool. So one experiment that you can do is you can go around the existing points or maybe start with this. So, so you can start with your model. Uh, that's the original point cloud that you provided with, let's say 1,000 points. And now, some points, they never scream the loudest, right? So they're just not important for the global operation. So let's remove those. We can easily detect those. We can just remove those. And they're asking, okay, so what, what are we left with? Like, can we understand what the model has learned in terms of kind of some internal uh, representation? If we throw those out, we get a set of, of what they refer to as, I think, the critical points or something like that. And the critical point set shows you that you know at least it makes some sense. You get the boundaries of the object. You get maybe you know important parts that hint towards what that thing is because that was useful for a classification task, right? So that's one experiment. You can also do the opposite, right? You can add points as long as you add points that don't change um, the global pooling, namely the representation of the model. So you can also do that, and then you can think of it as a way to do some kind of a densification of the cloud, but also kind of like to give you the minimal and maximal boundaries of, of uh, what you're allowed to do with the object you, you were given without changing its meaning the way the network is thinking of, the, of that object. So I thought that gives a, a little bit of uh, intuition. Right, right. So I, the way I think of this, uh, but maybe there's like a more uh, deep difference here, is that in this case, the object is your scene, right? And the parts are your objects, right? Yeah, I mean, definitely there's a different behavior. So for example, you can think of maybe networks learn uh, in, in, in image segmentation, maybe they learn to do some kind of compositions, right? So if you detected people and cars and whatever, animals, in, in they repeat at different places at different images. So you can kind of learn to detect those. And here, you know, if you've seen a wheel of a skateboard, maybe that doesn't mean that you're able to, to use that later on on different, different models. So it's not like a pedestrian in one scene. He will be also a pedestrian in a different scene, right? That's a part, but it's unique to that object. At the same time, there's much more context because if you've seen a pedestrian in, un, in one image, it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be more, right? But if there's like, you know, you just detected, I don't know, a, a skateboard kind of, uh, uh, a skateboard part and, and one of the wheels, then you know there should be more wheels, right? So you do have more, maybe more context if you're focused on a single object. It, it, does, it will not generalize to objects that are outside the class of objects, uh, but in terms of variability within the class, it generalizes decently, yeah. Yeah, if people here like care specifically about parts of 3D objects, then there's like a, recently a, a very large collection, and I mean, ping me, I'll, 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 give, you the, I'll give you the links, yeah. Right, so like 4D, yeah. right, 3D in, in time, yes. yes. So uh, I, I don't show it here, but there recently is a, um, is a technique that tries to focus specifically on, on that. Um, I think it's called a Minkowski Sparse Convolution Network. Yeah, yeah, following like the, the you know, Minkowski time thing, yeah. Yeah, so you can check that out. That's from CLBO's group in, in Stanford. And they're specifically, yeah, I, I think one of the problem is the um, data sets. So now you need moving dynamic scenes to work on. Uh, there's 
some recent releases. I, I forget by which company, but there's some recent releases of that, but not as many as you'd, you'd find uh, otherwise. Yeah. Um, the right. You just need you just need the companies to release that data, and also to annotate it sometimes. So this is an example of using that in scenes, right? So like scene segmentation uh, only in, in, in point clouds. And yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you that, that it should, it definitely has some similarities, but, but in general, it's a very different problem, right? To, to what's done in, in, in images. And even, well, one example of why it would sometimes be easier, for example, is that height is a very, very good hint. So I had a, like I had a work, I guess, five years ago, we, we used, I think, random forest to do some kind of uh, analysis of a scene. And the advantage was that, you know, we had to place the features ourselves. So we could, we could later see which features were very useful. And we had to detect, to do some kind of a segmentation of an indoor scene. And what we saw is that, uh, like, height almost immediately reveals, you know, desks. Right, so they, they tend to be at the same height always, right? So that's a very good hint uh, towards these things. So actually, in, in one of the advantages of working in, in 3D is that you have the actual absolute sizes, as opposed to images where, you know, the, depending on how far you are from the object, it could scale. Here you have the actual absolute sizes, so you can use that. That's, that's helpful. Yes. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah, I'll get back to that. I'll get back to that. Yes, thanks. Yeah, right. I mean... They don't have to be because if you think of having such a point cloud, then it's very easy to detect. Um, either you do some kind of a manual pre-processing of let's say the, the 99 percentile of the scene will usually hold uh, the floor, so you can just push that to be the zero, uh, the zero plane, or the network can just understand that on its own. Right. Yeah, yeah, but you probably don't want to include at the same scene rooms that are of two meter high and and 50 meter high. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I think they were, they were annotated on, um, uh, on reconstructed meshes of those scenes. And then for the purpose of this, were, were sampled again to be point clouds. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if it's reconstructed as meshes and, and there's like uh, plane detections, then, then there are like pretty easy tools out there that you can just kind of paint on top of the objects. It's not a fun job, don't get me wrong, but, but you still have to like rotate the, the surfaces and paint all over them. But, it's, it's not as bad as you think, like here, picking up point by point. Yes? It's a very good question. So the, this whole effort of individual objects is very, um, um, is, I'd say, like the leading effort in, in these simulated things. I, one problem with simulating scenes, and there have been some efforts, right? So I think one famous data set is the Sun, uh, uh, Sun CG um, that many people have, have, have used. It's just, in some sense, too easy, right? How do you generate a cluttered room with, you know, a bed that has kind of closed road on top of it? And, and you, you want that thing that they have in Coco dataset, right? You want the image equivalent uh, in, in 3D. So I think it very, fa very quickly becomes too easy to, to work on synthetic data. In, uh, in 3D for those tasks. But why do you say you want the same number of points? Because the architecture I showed, right? Right, so, so okay, so there are a couple of answers to this thing, right, and, and depending on what you care about. If it's, um, if your data came from the same scanner and it's similar scenes, so you can trust that, the, for example, density is not a property that you, that, that you worry is not constant, so it's pretty much constant, but sometimes you scan just little points and sometimes lots of points, then you can either, you know, normalize everything to a maximal amount of points and pad, or, um, or you can work on, on parts of the scene. If they're far enough, then maybe context doesn't hurt you so much. Or you can find a, a clever way to encode that into PyTorch. For, for example, what they did in the Minkowski network, I think, is, is like the representation is similar to the represent, representation you have in sparse uh, tensor representation. So you just add the, um, um, for each point, um, like it's below, like where it is in the batch, right? So you can imagine that all your examples are, or all your points from all the scenes that all in, in the entire batch are just concatenated to like one long 
uh, uh, vector, but, uh, but you just know you have the label for each point. You know which batch, uh, which scene it belongs to, essentially. So that's you know, just a practical solution to that. So that exists as well. Yeah. As for um, different densities, that's, that's a different problem, I'd say, because then you actually need a model that knows to handle different densities to learn that type of thing. So for example, if it's a, if it's a single viewpoint, uh, if it's a RGBD, right? So you have a single viewpoint of a scene and you have the depth per point, then it's still a, a regular grid in 2D, but a depth per point. So you'll, you'll probably have similar density no matter how far the object is. But if it's a lighter that scans like this, you'll probably have a, a denser density in the, in the nearby point than in the far, far away point. So mixing the two together is gonna be very tricky in one, uh, in, in one model. Right. Um, right. Another another thing that, that you can do with it is instead of consuming the point set, you can generate a point set, right? And um, so, again, like there have been some gen uh, ideas for generative model. Here in this case, they start with an image and then they process it, process it to have one representation as, as you do with any image. And then uh, and then you can go to, to 3D. And there are many techniques to do that. Like, for example, one, I don't, I don't think this one is doing that, but another technique is just converting the channels at some point to just a, jet, uh, a depth per point. So that, that, that's one, one option, right? Another option is to first have some kind of a, a autoencoder and then have your, your, sample, your image to sample from that uh, late representation. Right. The important bit, and so here let's maybe skip this for, for one second because what I wanna, what I wanna discuss is, is like, let's say you generated a point cloud how do you know if it's a good point cloud, right? So you need a way to measure, an orderless measure of uh, uh, measuring the loss between the sets. Again, if we're in the case of images, you can just place an image, one image on top of the other and measure their differences. Although you probably heard this week that this is also not the best technique always, right? But at least we have that as something to start with. Um, but what do we do with, with, with sets, right? We, we, want, we want to do this type of uh, assignment. So what is usually uh, uh, being done is, um, is use what's called uh, the chamfer distance. And just a simple way to understand is by visualization. So essentially you pick for, e for each point its closest, its closest point on the target. And also uh, you do the symmetric operator. So for each point on the target, you pick its uh, closest point uh, on the source. And you're essentially trying to minimize both, both distances, right? So that seems to be uh, simple enough of an expression so you could differentiate your entire network through and uh, works very well in practice. Right, and this allows for, uh, essentially this is the, the, like one of the important enablers to all those uh, generative models because you know, you know, you generated a chair, so okay, let's see if I can compare it to what I started with, if it's a VAE for it. Right, um, Another cool thing that you can do once you've generated some kind of a point cloud VAE um, is to do some kind of interpolation in latent space. Again, try, trying to probe what the network has, has learned, say, and you can see some you know, interesting transitions between one model of a chair to another model of a, of, a, of a chair. So there's something interesting going on there. Right. Right. One application that, that uh, um, goes more into the regime of, of, of entire scenes is object detection. And I'm gonna touch upon that RGB thing uh, very soon. So in this work, um, we were interested in, you know, we had a, a point cloud as input and we were trying to detect the location of 3D objects. And let's assume that we can all agree that a representation of how an object is detected is by finding its center and its bounding box. And I mean, let's not open for discussion what is a better representation for the existence of an object because that's, Endless. And essentially, you know, one thing you could do is just go directly from the points into those things. But that doesn't seem to work that well. And in fact, like state of the art methods, they, they currently were based on um, either you first detect the objects in 2D and then you search along 3D and that requires RGB or you do everything in a voxel grid. And 
what we found is that one reason, and that has to do with, um, you know, with scanning artifacts, uh, that, that is hard for you to do object detection, is that for object detection, you need to do, uh, you need to pass through a, po a, a stage of proposal that comes from a point inside the object, right? So if you, I think yesterday you probably heard about object detection in 2D, you probably um, were told that, you know, state of the art methods, they currently propose from a pixel, and a pixel belongs to the object. It's something you usually have if you have a, a, an object in a scene. The, the, sorry, the center of the bounding box is one of the pixels you're observing. That's not necessarily the case in 3D, in, in 3D point clouds, right? For, for example, look at this, uh, look at this scan uh, of this scene, right? So in many cases, the center of the bounding box of the object is not a point in the scene, right? Even if you have all the points of the object, the center it doesn't have to be on the, um, is not necessarily a part of the scan, right? It's just floating in, 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 in midair. And that's like a, kind of like one of the differences. And, and maybe when I said earlier, we're not using voxels because they have too many zeros, sometimes the zeros are useful, right? Because you want to hang some information there. And so how do you deal with, how do you cope with that in, in, in the case of 3D point clouds? So one option and that, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it, until now I talked about points as the existence of an, like if a point is, is somewhere in space, that means that there's an object there. But that's not necessarily the case, right? So what we did here, for example, is we just invented new virtual points. And you can invent any meaning you want to those points. Here, the, what we did is we took the, the scene points, a subsample of them, and we allowed each scene point to vote for where it thinks the object of, the, the center of the object is. So that created a bunch of new virtual points. They float in space, they have a 3D existence and location, but the information that they carry is the information about where the point thought is the center of an object. And the reason this is useful is now that you look at those clusters of points, you can think, okay, this is a grade. This is like a meeting place for all those points. It didn't, it's not a point I sampled. I couldn't work on it. I couldn't process it in the beginning, but now I created it. So it has some, I have like a place in space to hang all that information and also like a meeting place for all those points to discuss with each other and together jointly agree on where, where like, probably what's the more precise location and other features like the, the bounding box dimensions uh, of, of an object is. So um, this is an example of where points are not necessarily just points, but they're virtual points. So I think the mechanism is more, more general. Another work that I'm not showing here is, is predicting, instead of proposing a bounding box, it proposes like each, each point in the scene tries to find some kind of a, a, a feature representation of what he thinks the object looks like, and then uses kind of a generative way to represent that object. So he thinks like, okay, here's the, you know, that point here on that object, and what I'm going to do is instead of proposing a box, I'm going to just propose a bunch of points. Hopefully they're close enough to where the object, what the object actually looks like. Right. Um, so some examples of, of what, what you, can, you can do with it. So for example, uh, here, I'm just showing the RGB image because it's easier for us to understand what's going on. But the actual input is this. And um, you can see that like, we're able, to, for example, here to find more chairs that are more given in the, in the ground truth. Speaking of lazy labelers, you know. So like here, you know, the annotation for all those chairs, even though they are here, like someone just said, yeah, no, alg no algorithm is gonna find it in any case. So let's not annotate it, right? But in fact, in fact, you can. Um, yeah, about the usage of R, who asked the question about RGB? You did, all right. So about the usage of RGB. So this is not, uh, um, this is just from experience of myself, colleagues, and, and, and other researchers I talked, I talked with. This is a huge gap now in, in 3D of how to use RGB to do proper, say, object detection. It's not, it's not clear. So what happened until this work that, that we just recently, uh, uh, that we recently had, is that just result, results in general on object detection weren't that great. And so there were algorithms using 3D object detection or previous techniques for 3D object detection. And when they also introduced uh, color, they got improvement of say 10% or something like that. When we tried this voting scheme, we actually, passed all previous methods, we, we didn't use any RGB, and we passed all previous methods by like 10 to 15% accuracy. So 
that kind of means that even if RGB was helping, it's just because the thing was broken. So whatever you could use that to fix a little bit, it, it used. When we tried to also add RGB, we couldn't see significant improvement. And one reason for that was um, that there's not a whole lot of data here. And RGB sometimes have like a very good clue on where the object is, so you can overfit very quickly. Another, another explanation is the difference in resolution. So in 2D images, you have like a very dense resolution, but the 3D point cloud is, uh, usually has a much, much lower resolution, and also we often subsample. So we have less resolution here. And then how do you take the high resolution information from the image and push it into the low resolution point cloud is another question, right? You need to find a good way to do that. A third explanation, and I think all of them coexist. It's not like that one thing you know, is true and another is false. Uh, a third explanation is, is com comes from, say you wanna resolve the problem of, of fine tuning. So you say, of, sorry, of overfitting. And you say, okay, let's, let's pre-train the network on something. Then here's like a very general question we're trying to ask. What is a meaningful task to train a 2D image on so that the clue you'll have is a geometric cue? You understand what I'm saying? So essentially, there are works showing, for example, that if you, let's say you want to train, you want to free train on classification. You say, I don't care, give me two images from ImageNet, I'm going to train for classification. Is that going to be helpful to solve a 3D detection problem? It's a good question, right? So previous works show that these networks for classification, they care a whole lot about, a whole lot more about texture than they care about geometry. I think one example was if, if you take, uh, you know, an elephant and just replace its texture with the texture of a giraffe, then the network will still think, it will, will think it's, a, it's a giraffe. Hinting that it ignores the overall geometry of the thing. So in a case where the task you're actually interested in is geometric in nature, you probably don't want to solve classification or not in the usual way. So I think it opens up a very interesting um, kind of uh, area for research of what is a proper geometric task to perform on 2D images so that the features you learn are transferable to other, like to either to 3D or, or in general are useful. Right, so I think, I think the problem we saw is that it improves it too much, right? So it learns to kind of, to ignore the, RG, the, the 3D information or, or, you know, it very quickly overfits your train set so it does, doesn't generalize to your test set. But if you have tons and tons of data to train on, then, then yeah, then definitely RGB is useful. And maybe I should have also said that just adding RGB is very, very simple because until now we talked about the, the input to the network is n by three, but you can think of each point if it carries some RGB information or some other handcrafted descriptor you, you can compute from it, then it's just n by nine or whatever. Right, no, so, so it is annotated. The bounding box is given and annotated, so we can definitely supervise for the, for the centroid, even if it's not a point in the scene. It's the centroid of the bounding box of, of, of the object, of the tight bounding box of the object is what we're after. And the dimensions, and the orientation. Yeah, but it's true that, um, for example, in one of those data sets, they took the extra mile and gave us this, and, and gave, not us, but the community, the supervision of the A model box, namely the seen and unseen parts of the model, right? So if you have, for example, this, sorry, yeah, back of a chair here, then the supervision for the box will be the entire chair. And that you can do from the 2D image, for example, right? So you know you're not just given that. In, in that other data set we worked on, then the boxes are tight boxes. So if that, that was produced from a, a fused scan of, of indoor scenes, so they walked around and they sampled things, or whenever you have like, for example, a refrigerator, you only have the front side of the refrigerator, you never see the, the whole depth of the thing, and then you have a truncated box, and that's very complicated. Because now you have to tell your network, like the ground, the, the ground truth box you're looking at is gonna be very noisy, right? In some cases it's gonna be very deep, in some cases it's gonna be very shallow. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. All right, any more questions about point clouds? How are we with time? 30 minutes? Less, 20 minutes, 25, all right, cool. Okay, so 
probably uh, uh, you know a natural transition from from point clouds to um, to meshes would be to say that until now we only cared about the, bo the points, and now we also care about uh, how the points are connected. Right. So one good example is when when you know the connectivity. Let's start with that. That's simple, right? Someone told you what the connectivity between between the points. But maybe to have like a, maybe a more um, just take the understanding one step further. It's not exactly the same, right? Because for example, if you want to represent the stage I'm standing on, right? If you need a point to represent it, you need a whole bunch of points. But if you have meshes, so those triangles, then you can just take a bunch of points and connect them, right? That's enough. So you can go from a very dense point cloud to a mesh, that's great, but the, most com the more common case would be that you're given a mesh, namely it's a more efficient representation, representation of what already is there. So it's not really like, uh, you know, the two are the same only with edges. Um, so here's an example of, again, the explanation of why we need to develop things to work on the meshes, and that goes to non-rigid deformations of, uh, of shapes. So a useful use case of, of, uh, of meshes to represent non-rigid shapes. That means that the shapes uh, need to deform. And that here shows that if you keep using the same filters that you learned on one model, but now you say you deform this a little bit, then this is not going to be useful anymore. But if you can learn filters that kind of band along or, or deform along with your representation, that's more useful. You can reuse them. Right. So again, a demonstration of what is uh, intrinsic. So where do we have known connectivities? It actually, in many cases, right? So I work a lot on, on, on non-rigid 3D shapes, uh, so human shapes. We have very good models for those. We have uh, decent uh, meshes and, um, and also social graphs. So some companies have large social graphs and they know how people are connected. And um, so what do we want out of those? Um, out of those filters, right? So we want the same thing we have in, in 2D, right? So we want convolutional filters. And when I say we want convolutional filters, I actually mean we want to do weight sharing. That's like the key, the key property here, right? How do we share the weights from one location to other locations? There's lots of reoccurrences happening. We want to utilize it. Um, we want multiple layers because, you know, deeper networks are better, right? Uh, and we want, uh, again, some property of lo locality. And, and yeah, I'll say something about that uh, in a bit. Right, so I thought of how to present this, this topic because it has some history. And maybe you as physicists will appreciate it more, I don't know. I'm gonna start with giving you like the way people are currently kind of doing graph neural networks and then we can maybe discuss a little bit the, the, the history if there's time. So, like a very, very kind of natural way to do this uh, uh, graph neural network is that, okay, so you have, a, you, have a, um, you have the vertices and you have the, the edges so you know how they're connected. And let's say you have some features. Feature could be a trivial thing like um, um, just, you know, I put one and zero elsewhere on, on the existence of a, of a node, right? Or it could have a, a 3D meaning of like the, the location in space of that point, or it could be a feature that represents a person in a social graph. And you can also, also have edge features. So these could be, again, just ones and zeros, depending on whether two points are connected or not, but they could be more meaningful. Um, and what we want here that we lack, so what we lack here that we do have in, in images is some kind of an ordering. So if you have a filter, you can place it on top of your image and you, you know which weight multiplies which uh, kind of uh, you know, image location. Here you don't have that. So you again resort to some kind of a, um, uh, aggregation operator that's symmetric, right? Other max or sum. So now, essentially, what you have is this this type of uh, uh, symmetric operator. So you have a layer that consumes two vertices and and an edge, and just performs these symmetric operations on top of them. And then you can follow with some kind of a nonlinear function, right? So so what did we say here? Essentially, we said something super simple, right? So we want the output of a conv layer of that point. What we're gonna do is we're gonna place a filter. We know it's, say, the one ring of that. So we know the adjacency matrix of, of the graph. So we can just combine all the features, say we, we average, right? So we can combine all the features from nearby points, right? We push them through some kind of a nonlinear computation and that's our new value for the next stage, right? And we have, if we have a bunch of those filters, then we can represent things that are a little bit more complicated, right? So if you follow, like recent literature on graph neural networks, basically all methods, they use that. 
as like the baseline and then start complicating things from, from, from this point on. And complication can come in many forms. So they could either, you know, how do you prevent from just using this very simple operation? So for example, you can think of maybe I want to attend some points more than others, right? So I can think of how I weight an edge between two points according to how similar their features are. So that, that'll be very similar to an attention, uh, an attention network. So a graph attention network is doing exactly this. Um, right. Yeah, let me, let me show you what, how has this been done in, 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 in 3D. Right. So in 3D, for example, you can, again, if you want to not, so you start, first works have, have started with um, this notion of, and that's kind of like a bit of history that I'm, I'm a little trying to skip here, is that where people have realized, but I can just say in a few words, right? People have realized that, you know, it's very hard to define the shift operator on this structure, right? Different from a patch that you can just, you know, uh, um, you, you can just change its position in a very consistent way. If you have a graph, then how do you go from one point to the other? Well, luckily, you know, we have the Fourier transform and, and the theory that tells us that if you go to the Fourier basis, then this convolution operator just becomes a multiplication. Right, so the first works on graph neural networks were actually doing that. They were going to, they were computing the graph location that will allow you to take the signal and represent it as a bunch of coefficients in a Fourier transform. And then if you also represent your filters as a bunch of coefficients in, your, in the Fourier space, then you just need to learn those coefficients, multiply them, and then resynthesize the function if you want to go back to the primal. And you have to go back, actually the nonlinearity was introduced in the, in the primal space. So you have to go back do the nonlinearity. So forget the computational complexity for a second. You have a solution to that. One problem with that was that people saw that it's not, um, it's very sensitive to the graph. So the graph rotation is unique per graph, different from a Fourier, tra Fourier transform in 2D that will be the same for all images out there. In a graph, it depends on the graph. And this filters, the filters that people have learned weren't transferable to other graphs. And um, that's the property of uh, locality that I was mentioning earlier. And one way they solved it in, in 3D was to define local neighborhoods on a 3D mesh. So you have the one ring, you know each, each point, which other vertices it connects with. So you can build a local patch and extract it. And now if you want, you can be either doing the Fourier transform, so you can have this kind of a representation, or you can just find a way or you have, sorry, or you can do a symmetric operation that, that also ignores orientation. But if you're lucky and you're on a mesh, then you can actually use uh, properties like the, the, the largest curvature to kind of guide you as the north, right? So now you can rotate all patches to, be, uh, to have a consistent representation of the patches, and you can go back again to learn those features that you like in 2D, but only now on a mesh, right? So you can translate them between different, different positions. And different ways to measure the, you know, the distance between a point and the patch that you're, uh, that you're taking, that you're extracting uh, were, were proposed. And that addition was very helpful uh, in practice to do some kind of, so once you detect, this is a symmetric operator, like the one I showed here, right? But this one also already gives you a principal direction. So you can actually use uh, consistent patches representation to learn more, uh, um, so each filter can hold more, more information, can distinguish between the, you know, the hand oriented like this or oriented like that. Right, so, right. so, so for example, let's, let's, think, let's imagine you have a, a graph representation of, of, a, of a mesh of a person, and then suddenly you do something like a topological change. For, okay, so if, if I, you know, you computed some filters on this shape, but now the hands are touching, right? And there are you know, edges connecting these points, right? You don't know you don't know that these are separated. So you change the, the topology, suddenly you change something locally, but it influenced the entire global, uh, it had a, a global influence on, on the Fourier representation of the thing, right? So these type of, of changes were, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the learned filters were very sensitive to these type of changes. Yeah, and, and keeping local essentially means that well, depending on, on how you think of it. If you think of it in primal space, then being local is just being local. Just extract a patch that looks no further than a one or two hop. If you look in the Fourier space, you just think of very smooth functions, 
No, if you try to do that, you can do that on images as well, right? Yeah, that, then there, there shouldn't be a problem, right? The problem is that, that when, you, when, you have, when you have a graph or, or, or a shape, you have to compute a graph notation, and that now is different depending on, on the input. Now it, you know, it changes with respect to the input. So you need things that you can reliably transfer between, uh, you need filters that you can reliably transfer between different, uh, different graphs, and you can't have that. Sometimes it's okay, right? If you have, for example, a social graph that doesn't change, but only the signal on the graph changes, like a temporal signal, for example, between a bunch of people, then that may be fine, that's, that's may be fine right? If the gra graph is constant. So it's not that it's not useful, it's just that it's sensitive to uh, changes in, in the graph. Right? Partiality is another good example. Right? Um, so if you try to do a, a partial matching, let's say I, I scan you from the front side and I wanna find correspondences between each point on that graph and, uh, and a model of a human shape. Right? They'll also be very sensitive to the, um, to the, to the graph change. So what was the first topic? You, you said, should I think of them as, what was? Right, yes, right. I think I, think I can return the question to you, right? Because it, it, you, you, you're the one giving, building the graph, right? So here in the case where we assume the graph is given, then it's up to the user to decide what's an edge, or what's the meaning of an edge. So if you decided to take an image and build a graph from that image according to spatial proximity, that's one option. If you chose to build it according to color proximity, that's another option. And these will be different graphs, right? You can mix the two and be kind of a bilateral or, or, or whatever, but yeah. And, and if you are not given the graph, and so I think, yeah, let me give a couple of examples and then, and then I'll talk to you about when you're not given the graph and, and how is that, is that different. So this, this technique uh, I'm showing here, these techniques, have been used in, uh, mostly in, in, um, in shape matching applications where you want to, to find correspondences between each point, say on this graph, and uh, after the, the object has been, has been deformed. So this is showing like how close it is to the actual, or yeah the, the, yeah, the color here shows that if that point was wrong, how wrong it was, right? Where did the model think it, it belonged to? Um, yeah, like basically all these techniques that are deep learning based are now really outperforming all, all baselines. This I just had to show because we had such a cool visualization. We actually had a friend, an artist friend that generated those meshes. Uh, but the idea here again that um, this was kind of an example of how do you do that in, a non, in an unsupervised fashion, but I don't think I have time to go, to go into that. Um, yeah. So partiality, as, as I started to explain, is, is like another, uh, is another part where you really saw a difference between using um, you know, graph neural networks in the, like the Fourier graph neural networks and, and local filters. Mm. Sorry, partiality, I mean exactly the example I gave you. Like if you have a partial mesh, so this is given as a mesh, but uh, it, it's just produced from one viewpoint. So you're not seeing like, the other one. Uh, and the colors here are, are just the texture. So these should match some global, some complete model. If you want to tell me, uh, yeah. I think I'll skip, yeah, this is an example showing one, you know, concrete application, but maybe I'll just, you know, spend a minute on this slide, because this is like one concrete example of the usage of, of, a, uh, of a graph neural network. So just to understand the setting of the problem, the setting is that you're given a partial input. In this case, you know, we removed the limbs of, of a person and we wanted to complete them, right? And there are many plausible ways in which they could be completed, but let's, yeah. Forget about that for a while. Just, just think of, a, of like a partial graph and you wanna, uh, and you wanna learn how to encode that into some kind of a representation. So here we use a, a, a technique that actually uses this. The graph is the connectivity between the, the vertices. And this is like very similar to, actually if you think of a 2D convolution, but instead of, you know, now you're not allowed to place like one filter on top of the image and, and ask the, the order to stay constant. Instead, you can think of take, take each of those filters along the, its dimensions and just perform its computation, its multiplication with all the optional, with all your, your, your neighboring vertices, right? Then you can just have multiple of those. So essentially, yeah, I, I, it's a little bit hand wavy, but I'm just saying that in terms of computation 
uh, complexity. It's the same one as you'll have in, in, in images. It's just if you transpose the dimensions, the computation becomes a little bit different, but you get, you get this thing to look exactly like a graph, graph neural network, right? Um, so this will give you the, the output of each, of each new vertex. So again, you take the filters. Um, the important bit or the main difference from images is that now you can't commit to the location, so you're just taking each, each kind of, think of this as like a one-by-one one convolution, the best analogy, and that one-by-one one convolution is just doing that operation on all of your neighboring points, and then you aggregate. Right, so this way you're able to build from whatever input you have, uh, you, you stack those layers together to get, uh, to get a code. That way you can build an autoencoder. And that was the, the main kind of idea behind that, that work. So let's skip those details for a second. Um, yeah, let me go just to the point uh, here, right? So you asked earlier about um, what if you're not giving the, the edges, right? Or I wanted to talk about what happens if you're not giving the edges. So I'm using you as you know, just a surrogate. So, um, so I think until now, the examples that I gave, you know, they, they had the, the assumption of given the edges, so it was up to the user to say, how do you connect to two vertices, either by spatial proximity or by some other features. But this work, I think, was very interesting. Again, touching 3D, but now saying something a little bit different. It's basically saying, I have a bunch of points. Now, we already saw point cloud networks can embed each point in some high dimensional feature by looking at some aggregation of a local neighborhood. So what if I now invent edges and I invent them in the way that measures the difference between the features, right? So that's something, that's something I can do. And essentially what it does is that at each layer, I change my graph. The connectivity is being reinvented on the fly um, as I pass through different layers of the graph. So that's, that's called a dynamic graph, right? Another option that I haven't discussed, but it's like a, a, a very interesting extension that, that's been going on in, in also recent efforts, is to say edge features, if you give me edge, edge, edges in the graph, then I can only address edges that either exist on, or don't exist. But if I want them to hold more information, maybe I also want to update that information that they carry. So imagine that you, give me a you gave me a graph, but you have some errors there. So it's a, I don't know, some kind of a citation network or a social graph, and you accidentally connected two people, it should, that ad shouldn't be there. How can you fix that, right? So one option that we proposed, but recently there are many other, I think, techniques, is to work on the line graph or the dual graph, what's called, where each edge now becomes a node, and each node becomes the edge, right? So using the same techniques of graph neural networks, you can imagine like each layer is being, is being going back and forth between primal and dual. So you first have the dual to kind of update the edge uh, features, and then you use the updated edge features back in the primal graph and do another step of, of graph neural networks to update those. I'm trying to think if we ever tested it on, on weighted examples. I think eventually, even if, if it's, even if it's not weighted in the first iteration, it will become weighted in the second iteration, right? Right, right, right. So, so you have to take that weight into account. But why is that different than? Um, all right, I don't think I have enough time um, to kind of open up a, a new sort of representation, but let me just, so you'd know it exists, right? So we've seen voxel grids, we've seen point clouds, we've seen meshes. Recently, like in the past one year, roughly, there's been a lot of interest in, in this implicit surface representation. And that, the, the thing I, I'm excited about this topic, especially because I feel like it's very natural to ask a network to represent this uh, implicitly. So for example, networks are very good at uh, approximating, at doing classification, for example, right? And the way they do it is, or at least we hope, is by finding some smooth decision boundary. So some nice properties that we get, for example, the fact that, the, the, that they'll naturally, using a, a stochastic gradient descent, will find a regularized smooth uh, decision boundary for example, hints that if, if I represent, uh, if I'm trying to teach my network about the existence of, uh, of a surface, by like giving it points off the surface and on, and on the surface, and let's say that the input I give it is a little bit noisy, we can still ex uh, expect the network to behave the same way as you, if you would feed, let's say, 2% error into a classification network, right? Take MNIST, 
take 2% of your data, replace its, its label, the network will, will learn to, uh, to cope with that. So something similar will happen here, as, as, as recent papers show, which gives the, the network some, so this rigor, uh, rigor, natural rigorization that happens in networks gives you this nice smooth uh, um, decision boundary representation of, of the surface. So I think this is like a very promising direction. Actually, in order to go from that to having something that you can display, you have to use outside kind of uh, procedures like marching cubes or stuff like that that take occupancy and transform, transform them back to, uh, to meshes so you can display them. But it also gives a good opportunity to like use this uh, universality uh, uh, approximation theorem of, of, of networks that they can essentially represent any function uh, you want. So one example that maybe is a good go-to if you're interested in that, in that topic is the recent uh, uh, deep SDF paper. You can think of this as just, you know, you're learning to overfit to one specific shape. So the network doesn't see a collection of shape or one version of that paper is that where the network is just overfitting on a, on, a simple, on a single shape, and what you're learning is a code. Is, is, they call it an auto-decoder, right? So you learn a code, and when you introduce an XYZ point that you could think of like having a, a, like a cube of XYZ, you're just telling the network, okay, please sample whatever implicit representation of the, of the surface you have. Uh, please sample it at location XYZ. So from the existing XYZ points you have, or the, dice, uh, the distance functions of them to the surface, you can teach that network, but later on you can potentially sample at infinity, uh, um, infinitely dense resolution. And if the network is, uh, has learned something meaningful, then you should have like a free uh, high resolution version of, of whatever you started with. And it, it shows very promising results. I think this is a, a very cool uh, uh, direction to pursue. Uh, some interpolation results that they show, yeah, I think I'll finish here. Yeah.